I want to move from this to the actual history of macroeconomics. And I want to start by the time before Keynes. Now, the formalization that I'm presenting here is pretty much the standard one of pre-Keynesian economics, but it wasn't necessarily what you would have found if you were wandering around Cambridge or Oxford before Keynes came on the scene. But it is the essence of their verbal argument. The, the diagrammatic versions come later, so to speak. But I want to go back even earlier to the rise of neoclassic economics, which is in the 19th century with the rise of uh, Menger and Jevons and Walras and others who are trying to construct uh, a different vision of capitalism. And that's a key point. Neoclassical economics displaces the analysis of actual capitalism, which was the object of investigation of the classical tradition and Marx, with a completely idealized fictitious system. In that, in that so doing, it replaces the theory of real competition from the classical tradition with the theory of perfect competition in the neoclassical tradition. It replaces the idea of a turbulent, invisible hand in Smith with the idea of a general equilibrium, the fairy tale of general equilibrium. It, it replaces the effects of aggregate law uh, demand, real effects like the discovery of money or foreign demand on output and employment, which the classicals talk about all the time, uh, with the idea that you're always at full employment, which is Say's law. It replaces the endogenous theory of money, which you find in um, Marx um, and uh, others, uh, the banking school, for instance, with the idea of the quantity theory of money, which you do find in Ricardo um, and Hume, but you don't find in Marx. And it replaces the, the idea of complex and conflictual, conflictual behavior of individuals, the conflict between wages and profits, and hence between labor and capital, the conflict between buyer and seller, the conflict between consumer and producer. Those are conflictual relations, and they get replaced with utility, profit maximizing of passive, all-knowing, perfect agents. So this a set of assumptions is not just an algebraic set. It's a transformation of the whole conception of capitalism itself. And so when you accept that as your starting point, you're also accepting that as a vision of capitalism. Walrasian economics is a particular formulation of this general set of conceptions, and it's important because it became uh, dominant in the post-war period, especially in the United States. Marshallian economics, another version of that, of the neoclassic economics, it becomes dominant in England and to some extent in the United States, but Marshallian economics in the post-war period becomes central, and since that's key to the analysis of macro in the post-war period, I'm going to focus on the Walrasian side. What does Walras tell us? What does he say is the formulation, is the vision of the system? You have preferences, technology, and initial stocks of capital goods and labor power is given. You notice how static this is. Everything that's important from the history and the dynamics, not to mention the struggle, is given. All agents are assumed to operate in commodity-specific auction markets, managed by benevolent, very important, benevolent, all-seeing auctioneers who successfully direct the process of demand and supply um, bids and offers. Notice there's no actual demand and supply, it's bids and offers, towards uh, the point where prices balance in each market. And particularly important in understanding Walras is that no one is allowed to trade actually until everything balances globally. So trades only take place at the moment of general equilibrium. Now what does Walras tell us about this? He says, okay, imagine that each one of you represents a market. There are people who want to buy this good and people who want to sell the good, and so on down, all of you. I am the auctioneer, and I have on this giant board all the demands and supplies. These are offers, not actual demands. They're putative demand and supplies, uh, ex ante demand and supplies. And there are people saying, I'll buy uh, apples for so much, I'll buy cotton for so much, I'll buy metal for so much, and others saying, well, I'll offer it for that. And the bids and offers don't match because at any given price, the two don't match. So somehow, through a process that has never been formalized, even today, it's assumed that this process will arrive at a point in which in each market a price will flash on the board. Price for apples, a price for cotton, a price for uh, steel will flash, and that's the price that makes offers and bids in each market consistent with each other. That's the market clearing price. The assumption is that this can be found, and this is not a trivial issue because any price change will affect your bids and offers here, but also your bids and offers in other commodities in other places, so it's not clear how you arrive at this at all. But assuming you arrive at it, which is the standard way of neoclassical theory of dealing with difficult problems, let's just assume it, it's there, then only then are each of you in each market allowed to trade. But what would you trade? You have made an offer at any given price, and you're told the price, so you go ahead and carry out the offer. You buy it. You made an offer. You sell it. You made a bid of that commodity at any set of prices. The price that flashes, you go ahead and carry it out. But notice that the price is one that makes sure that offers and bids in each market match. Therefore, when anyone acts, all are acting, and they're acting in general equilibrium. You never leave the Garden of Eden. It's a 
amazing the influence of this formulation. And you know, if I write it out in a set of equations and people start to believe it's actually describing a process, but this is describing this point of general equilibrium. And the fact that you're allowed to act only in then means that any action outside of that is considered false trading. That's extraordinary. To me, it's like a religious statement, false trading. What does that mean? Real trading is always false. Non-existent trading is the only real. Uh, coordination failures, wrong signals. Now notice, in this deeply religious construction, agents at each level are assumed to neglect demand. Notice that if you act only when you arrive and you're given the, the permission to act, and I don't know if any dictator has ever achieved this level of control over people, but the Walrasian auctioneer is obviously the best dictator that ever existed because people do it and, uh, by assumption. Uh, you are not worried about whether your product will be sold or your labor power will be employed. Let's suppose you are the workers here. You put up your offers. You'll work for so much if the wage is this, and you'll work for so much if the wage is that. You have an upward sloping supply curve, right, each of you. Then the market flashes. The wage is now uh, $12 an hour below the minimum wage today, but it's a realistic number. And then you say, OK, well, in that case, I'll work so many hours. But that happens to be exactly the number of hours that your employers are looking for because the wall rate auctioneer is made clear. So as soon as you say that, you get the employment. You get matched up to your employers. And therefore, you are in full employment. Every stock is fully utilized. Every offer is realized. And that means in this conception, uh, you don't worry about demand. You're not asked. The auctioneer never says to you, do you think you'll get a job? Auctioneer says to you, how much would you like to work if the wage is $10, $12, $15? And you type in your answers, and then the flash comes on the screen, 12, and you go, OK, that's how much I'm going to work. But notice, at that price, the employers are saying, that's how much I'm going to employ. So each agent is freed from thinking about demand in this conception. And that's same true for the suppliers. They don't have to worry about, uh, for the buyers, they don't have to worry about the supply. They make an offer to buy. They make a bid to buy. But if the screen flashes the number that then determines your uh, 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 buy offer, your buy your bid, then that will be available. You never have to worry about supply either. So it's a wonderful uh, formulation because it eliminates the key uh, problem of every individual seller and buyer, which is the worry about whether anyone will buy it and anyone will provide it. Is that point clear? It's a very important issue. I want to contrast that to the conception of the same process of balance in Marx. Marx makes the point that the thing about capitalism, the whole thing about the invisible hand, is that nobody tells you what to bid, and nobody tells you what to offer. Nobody does, but of course, if you don't get jobs, you'll starve. So there are mechanisms that move you in the right direction. But there's no person. There's no agency. So each one of you is going into the market looking for work. Each one of you on the other side are going to the market planning to supply goods and therefore looking for workers and looking for raw materials and looking for investment goods if you want to expand. So everybody is making these plans individually on some judgment about the market in general, their local signals. But that means that the actual employment and output is predicated on the set of individual assumptions about consistency. Because when you decide to produce something, you put in a, a, a bid for some raw materials. You go and hire some workers, or you expect to find them anyway. You're hoping to find them. And then the workers are, will take the wages because they expect to find consumption goods and uh, be able to find financial assets for their savings. The firms are also looking for investment goods, so they expect to. So all of these plans made at the individual level, which are acted upon at some level, are inconsistent with everybody else because nobody says that my plan to expand is going to be consistent with the suppliers of raw materials or the supply of work or the supply of investment goods or whatever. There's no reason for that. Firms, of course, pay attention to the market signals, but they're local signals. So you can see that what happens is that there's an individual division of labor, as Marx puts it, across the society, micro level, detail, division of labor, and a set of expectations about consumption and all of that. And these get integrated through their inconsistency because there's no way to ensure that they're consistent. So this integration takes place through the ups and downs of the market. That's exactly what the market does. So I decide to expand. I hire some workers. Maybe I'm, I get them, maybe I don't. I put in a bid for raw materials investment. Maybe I get it, maybe I don't. Even if I do, I come out in the market and I discover, oops, the one mistake I made is that people don't want to buy it. At least not my new product, perhaps none of my product, because I had to make the assumption 
that all these things would be available to act. And there's nothing that guarantees that my assumption is consistent with the assumptions of millions of other people all making individual local assumptions. So the vision in Marx of this uh, balancing act is what he calls forcible integration of the division of labor into its social foundation. Because in the end, you can't do what you want to do unless people are there to supply what you need and there to buy what you produce. So that forcible integration, the market performs by turbulent regulation. And that's a point I made from the beginning of these lectures, in the last semester also. It's the ups and downs of the market that brings about forcible regulation. And then he makes a further point that periodic crises are the mechanism of uh, removing contradictions built up by these local forcible regulations. So when we say, look, the stock market went too high and then it collapsed, what does that mean? It means that basically these individual expectations were brought back into line with their social basis. OK? Any questions about that? So general equilibrium is such a bizarre concept when you think about it, because it pretends to be talking about individual freedom and uh, uh, about individual actions without any regulation, and yet eliminates the key problem of individual actions, which is how do you coordinate them? The idea, and, and the reason I say it's, it's an ideological and religious thing is because this uh, auctioneer, this invisible mechanism, makes everything perfect. If you start from that, then you're basically talking about uh, a system which is a, uh, a vision which has eliminated the real difficulty of getting there, of fluctuating up and down and collapsing periodically. So, um, Now, it's in this context that we come to pre-Keynesian economics. Because pre-Keynesian economics has a problem. The Walrasian problem is a fictional institutional framework. But, certain, but its result is so beautiful, from an ideological point of view at least, you still have to move to the level where you're talking about individual firms and individual households and individual sets of workers without the dictator, without the auctioneer. And the auctioneer is a dictator because you're not allowed to step out and trade on your own. You're only allowed to trade when you are given the signal. And then you run into a difficulty. How do you justify the assumption, key assumption, that individual units take supply and demand of their own activities as given? What does it mean to say that workers never care about whether there's a demand for their product? That firms never care about there's a demand for their uh, output? And that required the construction of what I call the quantity theory of competition, which is to say that if you assume that there are many, many different small individuals, then you could advance the argument that they, anything they do will not affect the demand for their product, workers individually. There are millions of them. So they can assume that if they choose to supply more labor or less labor, that's not going to affect the wage. And uh, firms are assumed to supply more or less output. That's not going to affect the price because they're all small. And that quantity theory of competition leads to the idea that everybody is demand indifferent on rational grounds because they're small. Now, I argued last time in, in the last semester also that this is logically inconsistent because it contradicts the idea that the individuals have perfect knowledge. Because if they had perfect knowledge, then whatever they did, they know others like them would do, which means that everything they do would be magnified to the maximum by everyone so that demand, uh, for any given level of demand, the effect on supply, the increase of supply would lower the price. So they could not make the assumption that the price is independent. I mean, look, imagine that uh, you have a set of workers who know there's higher wages over there, and they're thinking of moving. They take it for granted in neoclassical theory that no matter how many of them move, the wage will be the same. They'll get there, and they'll have that wage. But that's completely inconsistent because they must understand, if they had any knowledge at all, that if people crowd into a particular location, it's going to increase the supply and bring the wage down. The same thing for firms, obviously. So I argue that the theory of perfect competition is internally inconsistent. It's logically inconsistent because you cannot maintain it unless you assume that people have perfectly irrational expectations. Conversely, if they have even informed expectations, the quantity theory of competition falls apart. One, that implication, which I mentioned last time, is that it has an implication for macroeconomics, because macroeconomics builds its foundation on perfect competition and rational expectations. And my argument is those, those two are inconsistent with each, each other. So with this in mind, the amazing thing is that this obvious point is not mentioned. It's simply taken for granted. We say, well, firms have, down, have uh, horizontal demand curves. Why do they? Because they're so small. Everybody goes, OK, thank you. And then you just move on to the next algebraic assumption. But that's a logical statement. And that's something you have to pay attention to. 
So this is the framework that Keynes is now confronting when he comes on the scene. The pre-Keynesian orthodoxy says that labor markets are assumed to always clear and return to equilibrium quickly and efficiently when disturbed. Very important point. It's not enough that you are at full employment, but any deviation for full employment and what is called an external shock, because by assumption nothing is internal here. All the things that are internal have already been uh, assumed away. But assuming something comes from the outside, it shocks the labor market, maybe weather change or something like that, then uh, there may be unemployment for a while, but it'll quickly be eliminated. And the quickness is very important. If you had a theory like this that say general equilibrium takes 100 years, it would be a pretty hard sell. So if you're going to make the theory, you have to assume out mathematically that it's instantaneous and practically speaking that it's quick. Okay? Now, if you assume that the labor market clears quickly and there's full employment, then of course, given any structure of production, <coughs> the output will be the output determined by the full employment. So if you have, in the typical case, a, a production function, aggregate production function, if you're at full employment, you have full employment output. But if you have full employment output, it doesn't mean you can sell the full employment. Where does the demand come from? And for that, the, neo the neoclassical argument, the pre-Keynesian argument, needs a further assumption, which is that demand will be equal to supply at full employment. Obviously, that cannot be done by wages moving, because wages are brought you to full employment, so you need another variable. That variable is the interest rate. How does that work? Well, if you recall, if you say that excess demand can be, in the most abstract level, reduced to the difference between investment and savings, to just set up the notation, D is demand and Q is output. E is excess demand, the demand minus supply. Right? Demand can be broken into uh, three elements, which is consumption demand, investment demand, government demand, and export demand. Supply can be broken into domestic supply and imports. Everybody with me here? These are just accounting relations. Well, I can pull them together, C plus I minus Y minus T, which I add here, so that I get uh, the, the expenditures of the private sector minus the disposable income of the private sector. So that's the, what Wynne Godley used to call the private sector balance. Private sector expenditures minus private sector income, net of taxes, disposable income. Everybody with me here? Then what's left over is G, and I've got a minus T here because I added a minus T here, so there's a government balance. It's the expenditures minus the taxes, the government deficit. And uh, no, government excess expenditures is a government balance, and the exports minus imports, which is a foreign trade balance. So excess demand can be broken into the private sector balance, the government balance, and the foreign sector balance. I can also write this somewhat differently by uh, breaking this down as yt minus c. So I can take yt and bring the c over that way, and I have yt minus c, and that's savings. So I can write this as i minus s. I can rewrite the same equation as investment minus savings plus government, minus, uh, government expenditures minus taxes, exports minus imports. And again, investment minus savings can be broken down into business savings, which is retained earnings, and household savings. These are all accounting relations, but they play a big role in what follows. So it's important that you get a feel for them. I'm not assuming that savings are abstract, that household savings is coming, that uh, businesses don't save. I don't want to make any of those assumptions. I want to show you that different theories force those assumptions in an inappropriate way onto the basic accounting framework. So this is a framework that's more general. Because consumption appears on both sides here. So aggregate demand minus aggregate supply can be summarized as investment minus savings. Then something that makes investment and savings equal to each other will make demand equal to supply. So you have the labor supply at a given wage determining full employment output. The labor supply and labor demand uh, at a given wage determine full employment here, full employment determines full employment output, and then the relationship between investment demand and supply determines the demand. It makes excess demand equal, and excess demand, so you have full employment determines the full employment output. Ec demand will be equal to supply if investment equals savings, so anything that makes investment equal to savings will give you demand to justify full employment output. It, it's quite elegant in a certain sort of way, but fictitious, but element, uh, elegant in the sense that it captures the sort of uh, dominates the uh, profession in orthodoxy. Now, there are many other parts of the profession that don't accept it, but they're always marginalized. They don't make it to Cambridge and Oxford, so to speak. Dobb is there, and Srafa is there, but the, the people who are the key figures, so to speak, are not in that. Pigou. 
Um, and here comes the whole idea of um, uh, the loanable funds market. Because if you can treat investment as the demand for funds, now that assumes that if you're doing investment, it's not internally financed, by the way. So the investment is a demand for funds, and savings is a supply of funds, then the interest rate seems to be the variable that links the demand and supply of funds. So this is the demand investment because the demand of loanable funds, uh, savings is supply of loanable funds, the interest rate is the market clearing variable, so then the interest rate will make demand and supply equal. So now you have two variables. You have the wage rate makes the demand and supply for labor equal. That produces full employment of labor. Given the production function, that produces full employment output. That full employment output is your supply, and then the interest rate moves to make Simultaneously, the interest rate makes uh, demand equal to supply at the full employment level. And lo and behold, you have the neoclassical pre-Keynesian framework. Two key variables, wages and interest rates at an aggregate level, because prices only determine real things, uh, uh, well, only affect nominal variables, not real, clear the market. And since both are assumed to rapidly operate, it means any deviations from demand and supply, any deviations from full employment will be quickly taken care of. Notice in this framework that prices don't play a role at the aggregate demand level. Uh, they play a role at the nominal level, but not at the real. And these are all real variables here. And the classical uh, framework says the price level is determined by the quantity theory of money. So now we have here enough information. Output is determined at the full employment level. Demand is determined at the full employment level by the interest rate adjustment. And then the price level depends on how much money you pump into the system. Because if it's higher, if given a particular level of full employment, if you increase the money supply, you're creating aggregate demand for goods, and that raises price level. So the money supply only affects the price, but not the nominal, no, the nominal, not the real levels. Everybody with me here? This should be familiar. This implies also that real variables, like the real wage and the interest rate, because the interest rate here has to be the real interest rate. Otherwise, that story doesn't work. The price would affect it. So the real interest rate and the real wage are not dependent on the price level. In fact, the real interest rate is usually taken to be determined by the marginal productivity of capital. So is determined by real forces. So in this framework, money is neutral because it determines the price level, but it doesn't determine real variables. And that's the famous notion of the neutrality of money. It, it's a scaling factor, fundamentally. Um, and lastly, there's no room for government. I haven't said anything about government. Why would I need it? It produces full employment. It produces demand equal to supply at full employment. So you don't need the state. And that implies by implication that the state is there for deviations from this perfection, the traditional justification for the state, protecting you from foreigners and um, uh, interfering where uh, competition doesn't obtain or some other imperfections arise. But you don't need the state uh, fundamentally to regulate the system. Now, this is the framework that Keynes is operating in. And I just want to run through the, the uh, familiar geometric form of this. Can you, you can't see it. Okay, let me just see if I can make it a little bit smaller. A little bit bigger. Okay. So here is the traditional representation of the pre-Keynesian argument. You have labor demand and labor supply creates a wage, real wage. Okay. That real wage creates a, uh, gives you an equilibrium level of full employment output. Full employment output goes up on the aggregate production function to give you, uh, I'm sorry, full employment of labor gives you, goes up to give you a full employment output. Now this is a supply. Here's a demand and supply in the labor market, so that's taken care of. Here we have the supply in the commodity market, and we need to take care of the demand side of it. And a, a clearer, more transparent version of that is to say that we have here investment, uh, is the demand for loanable funds declines as the interest rate uh, I'm sorry, rises as the interest rate falls. Obviously, the interest rate falls, you want to borrow more, so that's a downward sloping. The supply of loanable funds rises as the interest rate rises. If the higher the interest rate, the more you want to save uh, and make available funds. And so the interest rate, expressed here as a real interest rate, by the way, makes the demand and supply for loanable funds equal. But by so doing, it makes investment equal to savings and makes demand equal to supply. So in these three little diagrams, you have the fundamental structure of the pre-classical argument. And it's very. Uh, seemingly uh, um, impregnable because production function, equilibrium in the labor market, labor demand and supply, labor uh, uh, savings, um, supply and demand for loanable funds, and the assumption that market's clear. 
the, the last assumption, as I said, is that if you are anywhere else, here or up here, then um, the markets will adjust quickly and bring you back. So you have the notion of a system which reacts to shocks quickly to bring you back to equilibrium. And so therefore, you're justified in dealing with the equilibrium properties of the system. 